Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to the Everything Astronomy podcast. Today, Michael and, Michael and I are joined by Professor Monica Valeri from the Astronomy Department at Michigan. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for being on our show. Thank you. So our, the, we thought that the, um, an interesting first question would be to talk about what it, where you got your inspiration to study astronomy and to study physics, because most of the professors that we've talked to before on this podcast grew up uh, at, towards the end of the space race. And a lot of them told us that they found, they found at least a big part of their passion for space and for physics in those stories of the, the, of the space race and space exploration of the, of the 60s and early 70s. Growing up in India, were you attracted to physics and astronomy because of that? Was that ever a part of your life or did you find your inspiration for physics and astronomy from, from some other source? Yeah, so I will say that the you know growing up in India, um, I should have been much more aware of the space race. Uh, I was, you know, sort of s slightly, but that was not because it was. I mean, so I grew up entirely all the way through, you know, twelfth grade. I think we didn't have a TV at home. I mean, TV started coming in maybe in the, you know, maybe when I was in eighth or ninth grade, but for some reason we didn't get one in our household until later. So I did not, um, and you know, I was, I was about, I guess I, you know, I, I did, I was around as I was a kid when the space race was in progress, but I was not as, I didn't watch um, the lawn, you know, the, the launches to the moon or any of those things. Uh, just because it wasn't an option. But my father was, um, uh, an, a, was an aeronautical engineer. Um, and in fact, he had been trained as an aeronautical engineer at you know, one of the prestigious labs in, in Caltech. And he, he worked for you know, space industry here in the US for 15 years before he went back to India. And then he headed up a research lab. And so, um, I was, and then, you know, one of my close uncles was basically the head of the space program in India. So I knew a lot about the space, space program, but that was, strangely, that was not uh, something that I ever thought I would, would do. Mm. Um, I was always interested in physics and that was, you know, I think by the time I was in like fifth or sixth grade, I was really interested in physics. Um, one of the things I will say is that part of that was that, you know, my, my, my father would take my brother and I to his, his research lab, which he ran. I mean, it was this giant aerospace research lab with, you know, with, with, but he would just, we would just tag along with him. I think when my mother was a teacher. And so when we, our schools were on vacation, sometimes her school was not, and he would just, he was like, he would babysit us. Literally, he would just take us to the lab. He was the director and we just walked around with him and we saw whatever was, was there to see. And so I just felt very comfortable with science and technology from an early age. Um, but, but yeah, so I knew I wanted to do science, but it was not, I wouldn't say that the US space race or the Russian space race was directly influenced my childhood in that, in that way. And when you decided, when you actually committed to go study physics, was that, did, did you ever get pushback from people in your family, for example, telling you that either that wasn't going to be a viable career option, or on the other hand, maybe did you get lots of encouragement or help doing it? How, how did that kind of go about at the, at the early stages? Yeah, so there was a fair amount of pushback. Um, uh, and I think it was really because there was a very general, there was a general feeling that, um, that it was necessary to do something which was more practical, like engineering, um, because you know then you were assured of a job. But if you did physics, then it was kind of, um, you know, it was a hard climb to be an academic. And you know there was there isn't that there isn't even now that much funding for 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 physics in 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 India. And so there was that sense that this was. This was fine to do, but you know one should really try to do something else. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I picked a school um, 
uh, uh, for, for university, which had the option of doing what was called a dual degree, where I could do a degree in physics plus a de degree in engineering, um, you know, was sort of five, five years. And there were only two places that I was aware of at the time, where, or two or three, where you could do this. And I chose, uh, you know, I very deliberately chose to have physics as my primary degree and engineering as my second de secondary degree. And, um, uh, and, and then in about two years into the program, I just felt that I, you know, it was, a, it was a very heavy course load. You basically had to do these two degrees in five years, but you had, you know, whereas somebody would typically take maybe 18 credits a semester, you were taking 22 to 24 credits a semester, which was, which was really heavy. And I, after two years, I decided that I didn't enjoy the engineering classes enough to want to continue to do that. Um, and so there was a lot of pushback from, uh, you know, from my, my father, but he was always very supportive. I mean, he, he realized that I had a passion for physics and that I should do. So he actually, you know, supplemented it in many ways. He made it possible for me to talk to people who were physicists to get, you know, to, to do, to connected me with people who I might be inspired by. And so, um, so, so yeah, there wasn't any of the, I mean, it wasn't, it was just sort of directing me rather than stopping me from doing what I wanted. Yeah. And um, um, it, sorry, Michael, if we can hit back on the, uh, so you mentioned briefly that uh, in India, there are less funding, well, there are less funding opportunities for, uh, for physicists and for people like that. And that was actually something that Michael and I were, um, were wondering about when we, when we were preparing for this, for this podcast is, how how do how do physicists and scientists go about research in india or how, and how do students go about it given that they i would assume have or have less access to 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 grants and to experiments and to lab does that did you find ever that 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 has a, an impact on the way that scientists go about their daily lives and the direction that science goes or does that did that not really affect much um so so for for I mean so it's interesting you know uh, it is true that India is a um, is you know is a developing country, but uh, right from the from the time of you know so that is the Brit the British had a long legacy of 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 being in India and started a number of um, you know research institutions so the institution where I did my PhD the Indian Institute of Science was actually sort of, you know, founded during British times and had a strong culture of research, which sort of, you know, which was sort of started in the, in the, but it was, um, but, but for, <clears throat> so, so a lot of the research in India is funded in, a, by the government, by the, by the Indian government. Um, that uh, it's, uh, it, it's different in the sense that most research actually happens in dedicated research laboratories mm. uh, rather than in universities. So there are, um, you know, universities are primarily focused on education and that by that I mean undergraduate education or maybe master's ed level education. Whereas um, uh, the research institutions are focused on on research and getting and and PhD programs, and so often I mean so in a sense the university that I went to the Indian Institute of Science was unique in that it had been founded as a, as an institution of higher education but when I was a student it really mostly had graduate students it didn't have mm -hmm. it had a you know some very few undergraduate programs, but mostly it was a graduate institution. So, um, so it was reasonable, it was actually fairly well funded. Um, and then, then but the, you know, other places which have research institutions which take PhD students, the students would actually have to enroll in a local university, but, you know, which might or might not have a, grad, you know, course courses yep. for them to do, but they would do their research in the lab where they were working. And often, you know, often the getting a PhD is sort of an afterthought. You, you get a master's degree in science or 
in, in, in you know, engineering, you join a research lab as a permanent full-time employee, and then you realize, well, you're doing some research and maybe this could be a PhD thesis. And so then you go and get a, you know, you register for a PhD somewhere, but you continue to do your research and you, so it's a very different kind of, um, kind of approach to, uh, you know, to, to academic life. Yeah. Um, so you sort of almost, you only, you almost only do a PhD if you've already done some research, you've, you've already established, you know, the area in which you're going to work, you might even already have a permanent job. And so, you know, it's kind of different from, uh, it's changing now, there are more just standalone PhD programs. And so I was actually in a P program which was um, was new in the sense that it only knew in the sense that I was the I think I was the fifth uh, cohort of students who were high taken into that PhD you know into that astrophysics program but they didn't have astrophysics faculty they had only two at that institute but there were like three other research institutes in the same city and they all um, you know jointly taught classes they each had their own students and we just basically moved around um, either the faculty moved around or we moved around and we, you know, we took classes and we were free to take our, you know, do research in any of the research labs we wanted to. So, and if, um, if, sorry, if there weren't a lot of astrophysics faculty around, how did you then decide to go into astrophysics? Because you studied just regular physics, if I remember yeah. correctly, um, for your, for your degrees. And so how did you then make the transition to where, how did you decide to focus specifically on astrophysics? Yeah, so this was, that was just actually completely, almost completely an accident. Um, I, I, as an undergrad, I have been certain that I was going to do um, research in, in materials physics. Uh, and part of the reason was that, as you know, as I, so I had spent uh, three summers, um, the summer after, and, and a semester. So, you know, I think, so it's true that research, uh, I mean, there's not that much research done in, uh, by undergrads in universities, but the institution that I went to had this, had two programs which were required. I mean, so at the, in the second summer, we had to do an internship. It was a grade, you know, we got a grade for it um, at some institution. And we didn't, we didn't actually go and pick that institution. The uni well, we did sort of, but the university itself uh, found, you know, like 50 different institutions around the country, spread out everywhere, uh, and got them to commit to taking, say, 10 students over the mm -hmm. summer. Um, those institutions actually paid the students, and they also paid to have a university faculty member at the institution over the summer to sort of, you know, to act as an interface. Mm. And we had to, you know, we spent, I think we spent eight weeks or 10 weeks doing research in that, in that institution. We had to write reports and we were graded by the, you know, we had to write reports, we had to give talks, we had to, we were graded by that local faculty member. And so that was, that happened at the end. And that for that I did an, you know, I found a place where you could, you could apply to go to three or four different places and you, you know, they selected, you know, the university decided, selected finally where you went, but you know, you had some choices. Hmm. So I went and I worked in an X-ray crystallography lab and did, I don't know, I did, I can't exactly remember. I, yeah, no, it was not X-ray crystallography. It was high pressure physics where you, you know, you have these like high pressure, you put in like these devices hmm. and you put high pressure on them and you, you see phase transformations. And so I remember like working, doing X-ray crystallography of those high pressure devices. So it was just, you know, you did something over the summer, it was interesting. Then at the end of the uh, second, third year uh, of, of college, I applied to go to um, something called the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research mm -hmm. in Mumbai, which was, a you know, had nuclear physics, um, uh, also all kinds of other physics. And I did um, work on semiconductors again for 10 weeks. And then in the final year of our um, of of our bachelor's, you could do you had to do a six month internship, and it had to be either you could do it either in the first semester or the second semester, but again it was sort of organized by the university. So that same 
those same set of institutions that we went to as, you know, in the second year, you could choose to go to, to do a six month project. And so that I did, again, it was, again, a materials thing, physics thing. I, I actually, I was looking at, uh, yeah, I don't know, some the kinds of subs, alloy, what do you call it? Yeah, sort of anodizing on, you know, aluminum and look, making colors on aluminum by imprinting little metals, you know, and I wrote down some, I wrote some code to help them calculate how to determine the colors of the metals that, you know, these anodized things that they were creating. So it was like, you know, small six month projects, but I, it was like very focused on materials physics um, and, you know, solid, what was called solid state physics. Uh, but just happened that one of these colleagues of my father, who who happened to be uh, also from one of these groups, um, ha, you know, he'd retired and my father said, well, go talk to him because he can tell you how to prepare for this interview for grad school. You know, it was, you had to write this exam and then you had to go and you had to appear. And if you got through that written exam, uh, three hour written exam, which was like, phys you know, it was basically like a physics GRE kind of exam. Then you had to go in for an interview with with the specific groups who were hiring students. Mm. So he said, "Go ask him what you know what these interviews are like because he's been a member of that that department and you know he'd retired by then." So I went to talk to him and I told him the places I was going for the materials physics lab, the X-ray crystallography lab, the theoretical condensed matter physics lab, and he said, "Why are you not applying to the astrophysics lab?" And I said. Well, I don't know anything about astrophysics, and um, you know, astrophysics is too esoteric. And you know, India is a poor country. We need to do things which will help the country. And he said, you know, I've spent my entire life doing materials physics, but astronomy and astrophysics is the future. And um, you know, and he told me about how sort of the, the there were all these. He said, you know, CCD devices and. This was, but remember, this was in the early 90, uh, late 80s. He says, you know, CCD devices were invented to do low, um, low light uh, sensitivity photography, and they're going to be the wave of the future. They'll be used a lot in the future. And of course, now all of us have a little CCD yeah. camera in our phones, and we just take it for granted. But you know, at that time, this. Was, so he said. You know, don't don't underestimate the the value of fundamental research. It's um, so, and I said, but I don't know anything about astrophysics. How can I go for an astrophysics interview? And he says, well, most undergraduate programs in in India don't have don't teach astrophysics, so they're going to interview for you for your knowledge of physics and mathematics. And so, but anyway, if you want something, here's a book that you can use. And he gave me this, you know, this classic textbook by Frank Shu. Um, and said, you know, read through the first few chapters and look at it and you'll get a sense of what they might. And I think I maybe read three chapters. I was, you know, at that was as much as I could get through. Um, and then I, but it turned out, so so I was just, and I was still not convinced. So I didn't actually apply to to, to sign up for that, that astrophysics interview. But I was sitting there, I had like an 8 a.m. interview or 10 a.m. interview and the next one was at 4 p.m. And I was like, you know, went for lunch, came back, was sitting in this room and I saw the sign on the blackboard saying, we're taking more interviewees for astrophysics. Anybody who would like to can just come and sign up at the desk. And I thought, heck, I'm sitting here for a few hours, why not? And I went in and they said, yeah, sure, you can sign up for these interviews. And I signed up for the two interviews for astrophysics, there were two groups. Um, and I mean, about 40 minutes into the interview, I realized, okay, this is going well. This has gone longer than any of the other interviews I've done. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, they were just fun. I mean, I, I, at the end of those interviews, I realized I had enjoyed them much more than I had any of the others because in part, because I was like, okay, I don't know anything about what, you know, you ask me what you want. I'll tell you what I think it should be based on what physics I know. And it was, apparently exactly what they were <laughs> they were looking for you know i mean so it was just it was just that and so after that i went to the same person i said what do you think i do should do and in the meantime somebody on that group had called him and said told him oh she really did well on this interview you should persuade her to join our, our group <laughs> um and so so that was basically it it was literally just that um spur of the moment thing um I mean, I did talk to a few people, 
And most of the people I talked to said, yes, this is really where it's going, you know, this is the direction. This is an important direction, which is going to get more important in future. And had you ever considered leaving India? Because you said that your father, for example, worked in the US before returning to India. Did you consider going to try to do grad school or in the US or was that never a thought? It was. It was definitely something that I wanted to do and that other people wanted me to do. But um, by the time I finished college, my, uh, uh, my, my now husband and I had, had been in a serious relationship for a long time. And I just, he didn't want to leave India at the time. He was, um, he was an engineer. He, you know, started, he wanted to start working for a company. And then he started, he, then he moved on to get his MBA. And, you know, he was at that time determined that he wanted to stay in India. He had no interest in leaving. And so, um, you know, at the time I thought to myself, if I leave, then I'm not sure this relationship would last. And and I just, I don't know, I just chose my personal life over my, um, over, um, over going to the US, I guess, yeah. to, to study. Um, and, you know, again, I talked to people and um, there were, you know, the, the there were people who, who, I mean, a lot of the people who, who talked to me said that the program that I was trying, choosing to be in was definitely a good program and I would learn a lot. And, you know, it, I would have to work very hard to get exposure, international exposure. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, but I don't know, I was short-sighted i just saw what i wanted to do night then and i think to some extent that's all you can do right you make a decision based on what your choices are in the moment and uh, i think it was a good decision i i really am happy with with how it worked out and so once you passed through this interview and you made this decision to enter this program for astrophysics how did you go about this graduate school program was it more of how it is nowadays with graduate school where you're still taking classes and then you're being introduced to this research group or were you free to find some subject that interests you within astrophysics? So no, we did, we did take a full year and a half of classes. Um, and you know, there were the, the standard, you know, stellar astrophysics, radiation, radiation astrophysics, uh, uh, cosmology, galaxies, interstellar medium, you know, the standard things that you would learn in any astrophysics program. Um, and then we also had to do a, a summer project, which had to be an experimental, sort of an observing or experimental project. Um, but then after that, we were free to choose who we wanted to work with. So in fact, for the first year, we did not have to choose to work with any specific person. Um, and I only chose an advisor um, at the end of the first year. Um, and then I think we did have a little, yeah, so at the end of the first year, we chose an advisor, it was six months more of, of classes. And then, you know, then, then at the end of the second year, we had a candidacy exam, which was an oral, oral exam, um, partly focused on the research we'd done that year, but also on, on all the classwork, you know, coursework that we'd done. So in that way, it was very similar to the U.S. graduate programs. And um, one thing that we, uh, another thing that we thought would, would be interesting to talk about is, is the role of computers already at, at the time, if you will. Um, because nowadays it seems like a lot, well, uh, clearly a lot of astronomers spend a lot of time doing uh, computer related stuff and analyzing data and making simulations and making models. Was, was that already the direction that astronomy was taking when you embarked on your PhD? Or was, were computers really not so widespread in the field yet? Oh no, they were beginning to be important. Um, I think there was still resistance from the, from people who were, you know, the old, the old guard who felt that things should be more pen and paper and you should, not really use. In fact, in fact, I, um, you know, I, I did my, my work, my, most of my thesis work was actually computational. Um, and I wrote 
you know, my own code to write to do some simulations of galaxy uh, effects of tidal fields on galaxies and clusters. Um, it wasn't a very fancy code, but I, you know, I actually wrote it from scratch. And it was very quickly obvious to me that the desktop, you know, PC that I was running it on was not not going to work be enough so i uh, went to the you know one of the nearby institutions and asked to use their their big you know room the, this mainframe computer that filled this room and um uh, it was a it was i mean and the, i think it was yeah and i can't remember some some machine uh and I, so you had a little terminal, you could write your code and you know it would run. But for some reason, the director of that institution determined that every night the computer had to be shut down. <laughs> or not every night, at 5 p.m. every day, the computer had to be shut down and was only started up at 8 p.m. So anything that ran more than eight hours was not going to, you know, was not going to work. And I actually, at some point, I realized that my code was not, was, you know, it wasn't as if those computers were particularly fast at that time. You know, the fairly slow computers, I think our phones are faster than those computers <laughs> were. But I, I remember going to the director and saying, look, my code is gonna run at least, you know, 24 hours. I need this computer to stay on. I can't, um, you know, I can't have it stop. I mean, I suppose I could have written out the data and then continued it or something like that, but it was just too complicated. And so he made this grand exception and said, okay, fine, we will let you let this computer be on. So, um, but it was all shared computers. We didn't, you know, the idea of having our own, mm -hmm. uh, there was a laptop or a machine that, yeah, that came late. Mm -hmm. And, and given that you now study galaxies or dark matter and black holes related to galaxies, and it seems that you mentioned that your uh, PhD was on galaxy clusters. Was there a time, or was, was that just kind of what you were uh, kind of started doing because your advisors were doing that? Or was that something that you fell in love with or, is there a reason that you continue to do that? And did you have exposure to other, you know, research? So I was always interested, well, let's see. Um, so I, you know, as a grad student, you get, you sort of get, take courses from uh, some people and you learn about a few things which are interesting. And so certainly the two, uh, you know, there were, there were a couple of other areas that I was interested in. The, I was very interested in galaxies and particularly in sort of dynamics of galaxies. So, so, you know, the focus on, on black holes and dark matter is just, is just because that's, where you know the tools of dynamics happen to um, to have led me right now, but mm -hmm. but really speaking, it's just it's just you know what we call galactic dynamics that I that is what I do. So that's the common theme, and um, but there was you know there was a professor who's working on pulsars, and I was really interested in what he was doing, but he happened to be just leaving for sabbatical that year. And he said, well, if I wanted to, I could work with his former graduate student who was going to be hanging around for a postdoc for another year, or I could, you know, but he was not going to be there for a year. And I thought about it and I decided I didn't, although it's turned out that that former graduate student is now a very eminent Indian scientist, I didn't know that I wanted to work with somebody who just finished their PhD, you know, was for my first year. So I, so I, when I picked somebody else who had um who was going to be around who who was you know not go, who was interested in taking a student so um yeah i it could have probably uh, done something different there was another person who was a very good uh solar physicist who was doing magneto hydrodynamics i thought that his work was also really interesting but um but yeah I mean, you know, there were other choices that I could have made, but I chose uh, <clears throat> chose to stay in gal galaxies. Um, my advisor was, um, you know, gave me a, a, a first project, but then I sort of, you know, sort of wrote that up and then had a second project, which sort of is related. But then I didn't really want to, um, you know, to to continue to look at the, that particular question, which was about 
hydrogen, atomic hydrogen in, in, in spiral galaxies and clusters, which was, would seem to me much more a radio astronomy kind of project if you wanted to focus rather than a dynamics project. So I um, came up with this, my own project for my, my thesis, which uh, I don't think my advisor had much faith in it for a, for a long time, but, um, but I will say that it is still cited. In fact, I just, you know, on a, I very rarely see papers which are discuss spiral galaxies, which cite me. And I, so I saw one this past weekend and I looked at it and I said, oh, what is it citing? I was looking at it and it said, oh, it's their 1993 PhD paper, which I felt very pleased about. So it's still, it's still, you know, a, a, an important paper that, well, I wouldn't say it's very important, but it's still, it's still relevant, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, well, I ended up being fairly focused on galaxies and clusters. And I went on to Columbia to do a, a first postdoc with somebody who was a radio observer who was interested in my modeling some of the data that she had in, in spiral, on spiral galaxies in clusters. Um, and then I went on to work on completely different, but dynamics related things. Um, um, is it easy to switch over from project or topic to to another one, or does it, or does it feel like you're starting from scratch again? And every time that you're trying to go in a new direction, you have to relearn all of this stuff that so many people already know before you actually get to be able to do research on it. Yeah, I mean, it is. It th there is a lot of learning every time you change to a new topic. Um, you have to, you know, you have to really educate yourself about what's been done in that field. Um, and I will say that it's, um, it's, you know, it depends on the field. Sometimes it's not that different, or at least sometimes the things that you have to teach yourself about are not that different from maybe what you have done before. But sometimes there's such a large amount of work that's already gone before that it's um that it's a challenge yeah um, and i think that you end up looking at anything through the lens of what you already know and so um often you can you know even if you go into a new f a field which you don't you're not familiar with the fact that you may be looking at it in a way that's different from what other people who've been working in it for a while are looking at it might give you some ideas for things that you could do which they may not have thought about so it's a uh, um you know i don't think it's all necessarily start it's not like starting at the bottom but you're starting yeah. at the bottom slightly dis dis dissociated from where you would be if you were a grad student and you can climb some of that hill fairly quickly and some of that hill you maybe you don't actually get to know all of the background but you can still contribute mm. so, yeah. and for example uh i i know that the many undergrads who start research find it kind of tough to deal with the line of when do i start committing to doing work and when do i start committing to doing quote unquote research as opposed to learning stuff that's already been discovered and just keep learning, reading more textbooks, reading more papers, or doing both, uh, I, I, which I think most people continue doing. How, how did you, did you ever find that line hard to cross from, how did you, did you find it hard to say, okay, now I, I know enough, I'm going to try to do research on, on my own and try to come up with my own ideas? I don't think you can do that. I mean, I don't think you can say I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to study everything in this field, and then this, you know, when I know everything, I'm going to start. You, you literally need to, you know, it's like you need to jump into the deep end, and yeah. um, it helps if you have an advisor who, who can sort of, you know, point you in the right direction um, and give you the appropriate reading material and tell you, you know, help explain things uh, a little bit but um but you know so even now i will say that one of the things and i certainly did this as a graduate student is i would look for for you know recent review articles mm. you know, which which sort of described sort of the breadth of the field or you know gave me a good overview of what 
what the broad questions in that on that issue were and that was that that even now i will do that you know if i'm looking for if i'm looking at a new question i'll say okay what, what what's the most recent review article on this topic because that at least gives you some idea of all the all the you know sort of summarizes the relevant yeah. literature if you try to go into you know every single paper that's kind of that's a much harder you you can start with the review article and then drill into the the topics that you're really interested in but um but i think you have to i mean to begin to start thinking of you know what's an interesting question you need to actually start grappling with understanding specific things mm -hmm. um and that's hard to it's hard to think about the things you you know people may not know until you actually have started thinking about the things which people do know so i don't know yeah. if I'm... that and you had, you had mentioned that uh in college in india that research wasn't necessarily something you were working on um compared to like joe and i here um where kind of freshman sophomore year we jumped into the deep end as you said in terms of research and trying to like balance between what we're learning in classes and uh trying to you know work on research on the side and i was curious to know if do you know if um kind of how the schooling in india has like evolved since when you were there and is is, is research as an undergrad something more common or is it still where you're waiting until uh, your master's and your phd to work on research yeah so so some things have changed in in india uh, i think by and large still um research is um is done in research institutions and mm -hmm. not at the at the teaching universities and so i think uh students um will um will apply to somebody to do summer internships where they can do research mm -hmm. um some places do have research sort of programs uh, in house um uh, and one of, you know, so the institution I went to to do my PhD, actually, I think about um, eight years ago, started an undergraduate program because they'd never had one before, but they did start an undergraduate PhD, I mean, undergraduate program, uh, you know, in all the science, you know, science disciplines. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was only a science institute. So there was only like physics, biology, chemistry, and engineering, so the, and mathematics. So there wasn't really any, um, I mean, I think there is a social, yeah, there's an economics and social science uh, department as well, but mostly it's a science institute. And so they did start a bachelor's program. And so um, there the students actually do research um, during their bachelor's, but it is not, um, it is something that people do off their own interest over the, typically over the summer. Okay. Okay. And then I guess transitioning now from uh, your PhD to moving to the United States for, you mentioned that you went or did your postdoc at both Columbia and Rutgers. And so what, because you had mentioned that you stayed in um, India for your PhD because of your now husband. Yeah. And so um, what was the motivation behind uh, moving to the U.S. Yeah. and during those programs? Yeah, so we, so we got married when I was, you know, two years into my PhD. He had uh two or three three years i guess he had in the meantime started uh take done a, uh an uh, an mba and it was working for a you know for a company um and i think he just got tired of the day-to-day -day of of work in working for a you know as a salesperson in a in a market in a company and uh, the other thing was that that my father was one of those who strongly believed that everybody should get a phd i mean he, I'm, I'm slightly joking that i but I, I sometimes joke that you know one of the things i knew as a child was that i had to brush my teeth every day and i had to get a phd so it was like you know so once my husband became part of my family my father would keep saying are you really going to go around selling whatever you're selling for the rest of your life. I mean, you're too bright a guy to sort of just sit around. You should go get a PhD. And so, yeah, sort of, sort of halfway through, I mean, so yeah, he applied for grad school 
in the US, he did, you know, and he did, he wanted to go into marketing. And so he actually went to Columbia University as a, for a PhD in marketing. Um, and uh, I stayed in India a year after he left. And then in, yeah, at the so, so for the last year of my PhD, I've stayed, stayed, well, for the last six months of my PhD and like six months I was waiting for, uh, for another, you know, eight months I was waiting for another position to come along while I was applying. And so then, um, so I stayed there, but then when I did apply, I applied to, to be in the New York area, uh, which was why it was, you know, that I went to Columbia University and Rutgers because it was within commuting distance of, of Manhattan. Okay. So, yeah, so I've, and I guess the bottom line is I've always put my, personal life first, <laughs> but no, I mean, it, it's worked, you know, you have to be, I think, I think that one year in, 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 while I was in India and he was in the US, I realized that I was completely unproductive. I didn't get any research done. And so I decided that that was, you know, I was A, not happy, B, not productive. This was not worthwhile. And so then after that, we just decided this was, you know, the experiment had been done and yeah, so I just, I just was glad that I was able to get a position. Mm -hmm. and, and then, yeah, go for it. I was going to say, and then your progression from Columbia then to, because I know with professors we've talked to before, it seems that they have one postdoc for several years, whereas you had yours at Columbia and you, then you moved over to New Jersey at um, Rutgers. And was that just, um, like, uh, was that just because of change in research interests or was that just because you only have that position or that funding for two years or three years and you move to another place? Yeah, so I would say that most, I mean, right now I would say in the current climate, most people do two postdocs, sometimes three. Um, and that was true even when I was a student. I think, um, uh, yeah, so partly it was, I wanted to stay on in that area. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, so I did, I guess I did five years of postdoctoral work there, or oh, most, maybe six, five. I did five years of postdoctoral work there mm -hmm. and then moved to uh, Chicago. Mm. And given that, uh, one thing that I always find surprising is that all of, you know, professors that, professors that teach us and professors that we've talked to, they're usually, they've usually spent like significant amount of time and dedicated a huge portion of their lives towards doing just research and discovering new things. But then, you know, as they become more experienced and they have more students and they start managing bigger projects, it seems that a lot of professors are actually spending a significant amount of time on doing other things, on managing projects, on making sure that things get done. And I'm always surprised to, to hear it, how, quote unquote, little time professors get to spend on doing their own research and doing their own work where they not having to worry about all these other constraints. And for your case, how, how do you break down your, your week? How much time do you think you, you get to do your own work as opposed to having to teach and meet other students and mentor people and talk to your grad students and write your proposals and all of that good stuff? Yeah, I mean, if I was a better, better organized person, I'd have that number off the top of my head. Um, like doing my own research is, you know, so it's a hard, it's a hard question to ask because a lot of the, so, so I think that what happens is that while when I was, when I was younger, all the research, all the papers that I wrote, I did, you know, 99 90% of the work and then somebody might do a little a few other things but but i wrote you know that i did my own research and i wrote papers but as you get uh, more senior you have students and uh, uh, postdocs that you work with and fortunately you also have more ideas that you know that are that you would like to work on but you don't necessarily have the time to do yourself and so I would say that all of the students who are working with me are um, working on things which I am, either it's an idea that I directly put in front of them and I said, hey, I want you to do work on this, 
or it's something that has come out as a result of something that you know we've had a discussion about so certainly with the undergraduates it's it's the former you know i tell them okay this is the project that i'm interested in um and you know here's what i'd like you to start doing and so um so so especially with undergraduates um you know i need to sort of break those projects down into smaller smaller things which are which are doable uh, but are also of interest to me so it, you know possibly it defines to some extent the kind the choice of projects that i am interested in but um even you know so with with a lot of the students so the undergrads who are working with me i do pay fairly close attention to what they're doing so you know they'll they'll tell me what they're doing every every week and often i'll end up as a result having to look for some papers read some read something to give them some direction so it's not management in the traditional sense of the word in the sense it's not like i'm doing i don't know looking at payroll or something i am managing the students but i'm managing their research in the sense that i'm actually trying to think about you know what's a useful direction to go so um and then of course with with graduate students they're more they tend to be more independent and with postdocs as well so <laughs> with the postdocs often they're you know they're sort of running off speeding off ahead on their own track and i'm a lot of the reading i'm doing is trying to keep up with what they're what they're actually doing and so it's it's um you know it's a mixture of things but i do manage to sort of spend some time i wouldn't i don't even know if it's any longer a fixed fraction of time a week i would say uh, you know for for instance over the summer i was able to spend a dedicated amount of time actually getting a you know project which i'd been thinking about for several years doing you know some simulations on for a few years but i finally finally got it written and submitted and um but it's it's less frequent that i'm able to sort of write a paper um i mean so write my own a, a paper of which i'm first author uh, most of the writing is happening for you know for students and postdocs so i'm still doing the helping with the writing and helping with the with the paper but i may not be the the first author of those papers yeah that i that's that's very that's very interesting that um to see how you kind of move from being just a soldier to more of a general managing managing things um and speaking of we uh, over the weekend michael and i talked to one of your undergrads rebecca who told us about your work on the dark matter halo on dark matter halos of galaxies which i thought was that's very that's very interesting stuff so could you briefly explain what what that is and what your research is on that yeah so um <clears throat> you know as we know dark matter halos are you know surround all galaxies um and there are lots of um simulations and have been for you know close to uh two decades uh, regarding the regarding the properties of these dark matter halos and uh, some of these properties uh, that that are predicted from from these cosmological simulations um relate to the behavior of these halos at small um small radii so or on small scales so there are predictions that these dark matter halos have very steep central density regions which we call cusps where the density rises uh, as a power law um and then there are predictions that um that there are lots of little small satellites around uh, a milky way like galaxy and then there are um, you know there are several other predictions on on milky way scales um and a problem with these small scale predictions is that they are very sensitive to what's happening with the normal matter so the normal matter like you know what we call baryons um falls into the center of the galaxy and it can um in a massive galaxy like the milky way it can cause this dark matter density i mean you just pull in more dark matter and it can actually make cusps steeper 
But in a low mass galaxy, like, um, you know, a, a dwarf galaxy of some kind, um, if you have the gas falling in and it forms stars, the energy that comes out of supernovae and, and just, you know, can, especially several, several generations of supernovae, can actually erase that central density cusp and make it shallower. So it's a little hard to know exactly what you predict for the for these small scale in, and the likewise for these satellites some of these satellites they are small enough that they can't hold on to their gas and so all the gas gets blown out and you don't even see the satellites so there are these you know predictions on small scales which is what most people have been focusing on which are really hard to um say anything about because i mean say anything definitive about because of this, about, because the fact we don't know yet enough about star formation and in, in galaxies, or at least our simulations don't match observations of star formation very well. So there are some other predictions, uh, one of which, in the, that's the one that Rebecca and I and you know, others are focused on. And one other prediction, another two predictions, one is that these dark matter halos are not spheres, but they're sort of what we call triaxial, so it's sort of football shaped. You know, they have, uh, they are, they are, you take a, take a sphere and you squash it in one direction and then you squash it in a different sense in the other direction. So it's got three slightly different axes. Um, so that, that's one prediction. And the other pr prediction of these triaxial halos is that they're sort of more spherical at small radii but triaxial at large radii. Um, and then if something is triaxial, then we know that galaxies interact via tides. And so these little triaxial halos actually start to get some, get a torque from something that's going by and they start spinning. So in, this, in the simulations we see, uh, in these large cosmological simulations, we see that these triaxial halos spin slightly, very slowly. Um, that spin is so slow, it's like the spin rate, the median spin rate, which was predicted is like, you know, nine degrees per giga year, okay? So it's like minuscule. It has practically no effect on any observable property of galaxies. And so it's been completely, you know, most people, there, have been, there were three papers in the ninth, well, one paper in the 90s, two papers in in, in the 2000s, and then there's no, no papers at all on this. And um, one of the undergraduates who's been working with me was looking at these, um, looking at some cosmological simulations, and we find that in the cosmological simulations with baryons, there are, there is still the spin, but that's okay, simulations, what, you know, and it's not that interesting. But one of the things we realized is that if you have tidal satellites orbiting the Milky Way and you know satellites like um, the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy get ripped apart there that the gravitational field of the Milky Way rips them apart and creates this like big tidal streamer which literally wraps around the Milky Way like 540 degrees at like one and a half turns of the Milky Way. And this tidal stream actually extends out to almost 100 kiloparsec. So it's, you know, we are the 100 kiloparsec is, so we are at, at a distance of eight kiloparsec from the center, which is um, 26,000 light years, I think. And so this goes out, you know, more than 10 times as far. And so if you may, so we did simulations which showed that even this very slow nine degrees per giga year rotation, if you're looking at something which is going that far out, it actually does make a difference. It makes a measurable difference. So that the, you know, the paper that we just submit, I submitted over the summer, uh, looks at the effect on the Sagittarius stream and how you can tell uh, that it might be rotating. We still have to do the actual modeling of data to show that, you know, what measure that rotation. But, um, but yeah, so, so Rebecca's working on a version of this problem with other tidal streams. So we think it's a new way in which we can sort of try and infer a property of dark matter, which has been, which has been predicted, but has not been verified. And so it's, uh, so, so, and then with regard to the shapes of halos, I have another, you know, other 
um, one of my postdocs has been working on measuring this, writing a code to measure a shape for the dark matter halo as a function of radius. Um, and so we're looking at these, these predictions, which are sort of less affected by baryons. Um, mm -hmm. As just so because 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 then you know maybe we'll have some some way to get a handle on. And uh, one thing that I know that many people that I tell that dark matter is a thing that it exists just look at me completely amazed because I tell them there's five times well there's a lot more of it than there is of normal baryonic matter, and for some reason we were able to measure some properties about dark matter, but what it is seems to still elude us nearly entirely. Does your, does your work kind of try to address, does your, would discoveries in your line of work address what dark matter is, or would it just keep telling us more about how it behaves with and but still not be able to answer the, what it really is? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So that is one of the things that we've been trying to do as well. Um, so, so, you know, as I said, some of the, so some types of dark matter make predictions for uh, how these satellites, uh, you know, these uh, satellites should look. So some, some types of dark matter, uh, there's one which is called, say, self-interacting dark matter. And in those, in those, um, um, in those theories, dark matter particles interact with each other uh, in the regions where the density is very high, and that causes them to become, you know, to create um, uh, gamma rays or some, you know, some kind of other um, annihilation uh, signature, which then ends up producing a core at the center rather than a cusp. Um, and so recently, uh, oh, you know, in the past year, a, a postdoc working with me um, was, uh, was looking at um, if these, if you have some a, a satellite which has a cusp uh, versus a satellite which has a core, and you have a say a globular cluster which is you know brought in by that satellite as into the Milky Way, if that satellite is mostly dark, you don't know whether it has a cusp or a core. But if there's a you know a glob globular cluster, and there are a few dwarf galaxies which actually have you know these globular clusters which have a like you know. Ten thousand to a million stars in them. They're very compact, and then they orbit inside this dark satellite. If it has a cusp, the cusp actually causes that globular cluster to get, create a tidal stream inside the globule inside the satellite. Whereas if it's a core, the core actually doesn't perturb this globular cluster so much. So when the satellite, then this globular cluster gets pulled into the Milky Way, and then you know, is released, you see tidal streams from the Milky Way, which actually look different, depending on whether it came in in a cusp, cuspy halo or whether it came in in a, in a cord halo. And so um, we are, you know, we can measure properties of the streams that we see in globular clusters, things like how, how, how thick are they in velocity space? How thick are they in, um, you know, in physical space? What's the distribution of angular momentum of all the stars in the globular cluster? And use that to sort of make some inference about what type of dark matter it might be. And so, so yeah, so we're you know, looking at things like that as well. And when you compare these models and these simulations to observable data, are you using, are you using data from like the Sloan Digital Sky Sur Survey that study these streams or is it um, the recent Gaia satellite? study them? Um, so a mixture of both. So, so, um, I, so some of the, um, so the Gaia, most of the tidal streams are far enough away that we don't have really good, um, you know, proper motion data that is motion, you know, prevent in the plane of the sky. We do have line spectroscopic Doppler velocities along the stream. Those don't come from Gaia, mostly they come from ground-based telescopes, but it's the common, but Gaia has been really good at, at um, detecting new streams. Um, it, because it's, it's all, I mean, you do have some proper motions and so you can make, you know, you can get models for what 
the um, because prop these line of sight velocities are harder to get, you can you know sort of see properties of these streams uh, from Gaia, and then you can go follow them up with uh, ground-based um, spectroscopic surveys. Okay, and then another question I had related to the dark matter halo is um, how f how f uh, much further does it extend from the center of the Milky Way than the baryonic matter? that we usually, th when we usually think of the Milky Way galaxy, we think of just the spiral galaxy, but how much further does it extend? And does it extend far enough to reach out to say, the dark matter halo of the Andromeda galaxy? Um, so we think that dark matter halos extend uh, for a Milky Way-like galaxy, extends out to, um, you know, 200 or, or 200 or 300 kiloparsec. So that, I mean, for scale, we think that the disk of the Milky Way is about, um, you know, 15 or 20 kiloparsec in, in the, in the, in optic, in, in stars, mm -hmm. it might extend out further in hydrogen. It's hard to tell for the Milky Way itself. Um, mm -hmm. And Andromeda probably has a similar, you know, it's a similarly massed galaxy. So we think that its halo um, extends out to a similar radius. So it's possible that the halos of, of you know, I mean, I think the mo most people would say that the, the Milky Way and Andromeda are, you know, their halos might be sort of touching at the middle, but, but not, they're not, there's, you know, maybe just the very edges of the halos are. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to say what the edge of the halo is because it may not have a hard edge. I mean, mm -hmm. probably doesn't have a hard edge. It's just sort of, where the density falls off below some number. So yeah, so it's much, we don't think that that um, we're yet in contact with Andromeda, but it's not that far. And then one other area of research that Joe and I found of yours is uh, not necessarily what we've been talking about related to uh, uh, dark matter and understanding satellite kinematics, but instead black holes and trying to understand how the, the the bar and center of some galaxies influences the mass of supermassive black holes. And so I guess I was hoping to kind of explain what that research is about and how you can kind of balance what seems like two very distinct research topics. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, they do. They do seem like very distinct research topics. Um, for me, the common theme is that I use the motions of stars to understand the properties of things we can't see. So, in in you know, in the case of um, of of black holes, the thing we can't can't see is the black hole, and in the case of uh, dark matter halos, it's it's the dark matter. But the stars and the motions of the stars are what are giving us what I'll call a dynamical uh, uh, estimate of the properties of those of the things we are interested in. Um, so. For for black holes, I I actually became interested in this during my uh, my second postdoc, um, and and it was really inspired by the fact that you know the the one of the people one of the professors in the department had had been a member of the instrument team which put the something called the the space telescope in uh, you know spectrograph. It was called STIS. Um, uh, space telescope, I guess, instrument. I don't remember what I stands for, but I would think it's a spectrograph um, on on the space on the Hubble Space Telescope. And so, one of the key projects of the Hubble Space Telescope was measuring the masses of black holes and galaxies. And so, the you know the group uh, asked, I mean, gave me the responsibility for writing a uh, code to do that, you know, to do that measurement, sort of get the, when we get the data from, from Hubble, um, you know, th they would process it and I would write the code to be able to derive the masses of black holes from, from that data. Um, and so, uh, so in a sense, you know, the, that work has continued since then. So it turned out that initially we were mostly focused on, on using Hubble, but then we were, you know, Hubble had only these long slits, the way you could put a slit down on top of a galaxy and get the, the, the spectra along that slit. Um, and, but then we started using ground-based telescopes with, uh, with what are called integral field units. So you have a, 
uh, a big square um, or a rectangular uh, you know instrument which has many many different little segments on it which from which it takes the spectra and so you get a two dimensional um, you know field of the of the of the galaxy so you can then say things about how not only how the the what the black hole mass is but how the stars around that black hole are moving um, and so uh, one of the things that came out of all of that work um, <clears throat> was the realization that the masses of black holes in galaxies are strongly correlated with the properties of the galaxies themselves. And so, um, uh, you know, that is the, the black hole mass is correlated with the amount, the amount of stars in the bulge. It's correlated with how fast the stars are moving, what we call the velocity dispersion of the stars. Um, and it's, um, it turns out that, you know, for the most part, people have been focused on what causes that relationship. It's clear that black holes, they are about, you know, they're mass, super massive, but they have a total mass of maybe 0.1% um, of the total mass of, of, the, of the stellar mass of the galaxy. So it's not like they're very, very massive relative to the rest of the mass, but because they are, um, they're, you know, they go through a phase when they are growing, they, they're sort of swallowing material from around them, they produce these enormous jets and winds, and they can influence the, the properties of the galaxy as a whole. Um, and so my interest in VARS came about for, for two reasons. One is um, looking at, um, you know, what we were doing with the Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based telescopes is looking at the motions really close to a black hole and trying to figure out how massive the black hole is. Now that's possible for nearby galaxies, but even with a 30 meter telescope, we're not gonna get, you know, very far out because you need to, you know, very high, what you call spatial resolution, angular resolution. Um, so and there's another method which uses time resolution. It uses the idea that if a black hole is active, then it emits some radiation and that radiation takes some time to propagate out through the, through the region around it. And it causes excitation in the lines you know, of gas which are flowing around it. So, you know, some, uh, an, uh, some, some emission line which is as a higher and the temperature is high at the center and sort of lower outside. So certain atomic lines are, you know, certain species are prominent at small radii and others are prominent at other radii. So if you see a burst in the in the in the in the AGN or the active galactic nucleus, it will you'll see the continuum rise that's coming from the central black hole. And then you'll see, you know, one line sort of intensity go up. And then a little later, you'll see another line intensity go off. And so if you track these objects over time, by looking at how this line propagated through, or at least this burst propagated through, you can tell just because, you know, we know the speed of light is, is constant. And so you can say, I know how much time light took to go from one place to another. So I know how far, far apart they are. And if you know how fast that, uh, that, that, because you're, also, you're already taking a spectrum, you know how fast that spectral line, you know, that gas which is producing that spectral line is moving, and so you can get an estimate of the black hole mass. But we, what we don't know is that there's all kinds of uncertainties about the geometry of this thing. We don't really know how that gas is distributed. So one of the projects I'm working on is, is getting for all these nearby galaxies which show this kind of signature, we're getting, motions of stars so that we can get two estimates we have this this estimate from the from the lines which is which is called reverberation mapping the 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 light reverberates through the different lines so it's called reverberation mapping and then we can also get an estimate from the motions of stars which is sort of the classical way of doing it and when you do that you can sort of maybe help to if you do that for enough galaxies you can get an estimate of how good is this reverberation mapping because you can do reverberation mapping out to any redshift all you need is to be able to watch those galaxies for long enough and you don't need the time resolution so we was, we'd started on this project to do that. And we discovered that like seven of the eight nearest reverberation mapping galaxies have bars in them. 
And when we started looking at those bars, we realized that it produce, you know, their motions are different from the kinds of motions we've assumed in bulges before. And so I sort of, you know, initially it seemed like a small rabbit hole that I was going down because nobody else was really paying attention to this. But I feel like there's now, you know, it also turns out coincidentally that, that you know, most people are interested in knowing how these black holes grow. Why do they grow in, you know, in, certain, in a certain way? And it turns out that in the nearby universe, um, most black holes actually are growing in disk galaxies or spiral galaxies like the Milky Way. They're not growing in elliptical galaxies, right? So it turns out that actually, if you want to know what's happening, why, how black holes are growing, it's really the disks you want to focus on. And it turns out that, you know, two thirds of disk galaxies have bars. So, so it's done, I mean, just it's, it, it just so happens that now, you know, people are realizing about well, bars are really important to, to look at because they not only, you know, they not only make it hard to measure black hole masses, which was the original reason why I sort of started on this, but they also influence, they must also influence the growth of black holes. And so that's the, you know, that's the direction that directions that we're looking at. And another, well, so I think one sort of natural follow-up to that is you, s you study black holes by studying normal baryonic matter around them and we study dark matter by looking at normal baryonic matter around it do you ever is it ever do people ever try to for example use to use well try to link the two try to think of black uh, black holes potentially affecting dark matter and dark matter potentially affecting black holes or is that not in the realm of science or is that not not yet a thing I'm sure people have thought about it. Um, you know, I mean, I think that the, the place where those two things intersect is sort of in the early universe where we think that the density of matter was high enough, the density of dark matter was high enough where, you know, there's some, some mass of primordial black holes might have formed. Um, in the current, um, you know, in the current universe, people have looked at things like, so, so let me say, some of the things that people have looked at in this context is at the centers of galaxies, um, you know, if you have a black hole, then material will sort of collect around it. And so one of the things that people have looked at is how does the presence of a black hole, as I said some few minutes, some minutes ago when I was talking about dark matter, the centers of dark matter halos are these very steep cusps, rising cusps. So one of the things that people have looked at is if you have a black hole at the center, how does it affect the, you know, the shape of this cusp? Is that you know one would expect that it would cause matter to con you know concentrate even further, and so people have looked at well if you have a black hole can you um, you know expect to detect more say you know gamma ray annihilation from this dark matter cusp? So there have been people who've written you know papers about it and tried to calculate it. Um, we don't think that you know black dark matter is getting accreted onto black holes in very significant amounts. It, it's just that dark matter tends to be very, um, very hot. So, you know, in the sense that it has a large velocity dispersion. And so it's hard to sort of train it into to staying in a, you know, in a particular place. And so I don't think that it's, so the, the answer is yes, there are ways in which they intersect, but, um, I don't know that there are too many ways in which they uh, intersect. And that that's uh, I I find it fascinating that I well I personally find it fascinating that sci well that we seem to be able to describe everything around us so well, but then there's so much more that we just have no idea about. And I've always found that a bizarre connection that we can understand all of these things on their own. Without un without seemingly have to un having to understand the role of dark matter, for example, um, and so I think one one good place one last one good last question would be to ask you where do you think where do you, what is 
the ultimate goal for your research group? Where, where would you, what kind of big questions would you like to be able to answer? Um, Apart from of obviously understanding everything in the universe from start to finish. <laughs> yeah. Um, hard to know. I think I, right. I mean, right, right now, I'm I'm really, uh, you know, I'm really interested to know what what the dark matter particle is, because I I feel like that is a a really important question to understand, um, and much of our knowledge of of the universe um, is influenced by i mean the much of the detailed knowledge of our universe is influenced by what the dark matter particle is mm. um, i don't specifically work in particle physics but but you know the kinds of things that i do i try to you know try to figure out what can i do as a dynamicist which which can inform our understanding of the particle nature of uh, of dark matter. So um, that's you know that's a question that I think uh, is really interesting to and me. And is it thought that there might be several? Because I've always ever heard of people saying there's you know there's all these options, but at the end there's probably only one that's right. Is it thought that there might be loads of different dark matter particles that just co coexist? Yeah, people have come up with different, um, different, you know, all kinds of different species of dark matter particles. Um, so the, the, you know, the the thing is that I think that that it's almost it's almost this, you know, Occam's razor kind of thing. You want to have the simplest possible explanation. Of course, the simplest possible explanation may not be the the right explanation. But I think from the point of view of, you know, let's not um, try to have try to invoke too many possible candidates. Uh, people have tried to focus on um, a few, but you know, even those few can have a range of parameters. So if you think of things like, like you know, what we call WIMPs or weakly interacting massive particles, they you know they could have a, a range of different masses uh, or energies that they they might span or if you think of an alternative which is called axions they might have again a different range of properties so um and and they might coexist but i i guess i i don't know enough about how uh different they would be i mean how well could you distinguish i mean there might be a lot of degeneracies you know you could say we'll have this many wimps and you know and and something else might be so which is why i think the experimental you know particle physics is really crucial to this and given that these particle physicists have been developing these experiments for decades now and the results at least in terms of uh definitively coming across a dark matter particle um uh, their results haven't really come up with that much in terms of an actual particle what do you think is necessary in the field of dark matter research to uh, you know figure out exactly what it is. Is it, is it going to come from kind of fine tuning these experiments and making them more precise than ever? Or is it going to be more, more of a shift in perspective as to asking different questions about the nature of dark matter? Um, so I don't know. I suspect it's a bit of both. I mean, I think that um, <clears throat> right now uh, there are some, you know, some experiments which are being developed i can't remember the acronyms off the top of my head which are trying to to do uh, you know get get to much greater sensitivities um for direct detection uh, experiments um and you know i i suspect that in the next decade we'll know whether they de detect anything or not mm -hmm. and but there are always you know there are always surprising results from astrophysics which uh tend to make us uh tend to open new directions um uh just just last month or so there was a a new measurement of uh, dark matter in clusters which uh, was looking at um you know like lensing strong what's called strong lensing in the number of the multiple 
images you get, you know, when you have gravitational lensing, which is one of the predictions of Einstein's theory, you, the, the mass of the, of the cluster, if you're observing a galaxy behind it, can cause multiple images. And those, <clears throat> you know, that lensing has been used to measure the properties of dark, of dark matter distributions and clusters. And so a comparison was done with some, I think, 11 clusters for which they had very deep lensing observations with some simulations, an equally you know, sophisticated set of simulations where they created mock images. And they found that the real clusters showed 10 times more um, strong lensing events than any of the simulations. And I don't think anybody knows yet what that means, but it probably does mean either there are many more sort of things which are causing this lensing in clusters than we know about, or the nature of dark matter makes it much you know, stronger in certain ways that it's able to make more lenses than we thought about. It's not clear what the answer is, but it's certainly telling us that there's, we are always finding new things and <clears throat> it's, um, yeah, I, it's it's going to come. I mean, I think the the, in, the 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 final solution, if there is one, is going to come from many different directions, probably. Yeah. Well, I mean that that was incredibly interesting. Thank you for talking to us, and I hope I really do hope that in my lifetime I will find out the answers to at least some of the questions and problems that we talked about today. So thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you so much. Professor You're Williams. welcome, and thank you so much for inviting me to the you know, to to speak on your podcast. I, it, it was a pleasure. Hey everyone, thank you for listening to this podcast episode. This is Michael. This is Sam. This is Tommy. And this is Joe. If you're listening to this on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to leave a review. All of the show notes can be found either in the description below or on our website. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next week with more Everything Astronomy.